Bueno, es un placer para nosotros presentar al profesor Jan Ruckman de la Universidad de Bergen en Noruega, que es un estrecho colaborador de nuestro grupo de, de investigación. Y bueno, pues eh, nos solemos ver con, con cierta frecuencia. Eh, nos conocemos ya desde, desde hace tiempo, de hecho eh, Jan estuvo en, en mi tribunal de tesis, así como Juan Enrique que también está aquí. Y bueno, eso fue ya hace tiempo. Y es un, un enorme placer eh, poder contar con, con su presencia y, y sin más eh, preámbulos podemos dar paso a, a la charla. Aquí tenemos el título, Strong Stability of the Generated C Stationary Points in Mathematical Programming with Complementary Constraints. Bueno, yo apago el, el micro y somos todo tuyos, Jan. Ok. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? I hope so. If not, please tell me. Uh, I also would like to um, say hello to Marco, especially here. Uh, I, I will give the talk in English because I understood from Juan that in principle it is also an international uh, uh, lecture. So I will talk uh, about uh, the concept of strong stability of degenerated C stationary points in MPCC. Uh, as you can see, it, I changed the title a little bit uh, because um, that is a work together with my uh, PhD student or my ex-PhD student. He just uh, finished, Daniel Hernandez Escobar, who is here the co-author. And uh, we made several papers about uh, this concept of strong stability of C stationary points and PCC. So for this lecture, we focus on a special uh, uh, chapter of it. But in any case, if you are interested in this uh, in the thesis or in more details, please let me know when we can I can send this to you. Okay, here is the outline of the talk. Uh, there are no surprising things there. After an introduction, I will give some notations and definitions. Then I will talk about necessary conditions for the strong stability, and uh, we will also talk then about uh, a special case. Uh, when the number of active constraints is n plus 1, where n is the dimension of the, of the space. Okay, so let us start uh, about uh, with the definition of the setting. We have a uh, finite index set L here, and all our functions are uh, belong to C2. They are twice continuously differentiable because uh, we are looking at strong stability. I will come to this in a moment, but uh, let me say a general word in order to modify, uh, to motivate why we are looking at C2 functions. We are allowing here perturbations up to second order. Yeah? So we, we are allowing the perturbation of the function value of the first derivative and also of the second derivative. Then our problem class under consideration, it's called in the literature mathematical program with complementarity constraints. And it is about to minimize function f subject to the feasible set here called m of r and s. So r and s are also vector of functions, rm and sm. And uh, complementarity constraints means, as most of you know, uh, that the minimum of both is equal to zero. So both are non-negative, but at least one of them must be zero. And that makes the, that is a difference, yeah? Uh, here in red. Um, that's the difference to the standard optimization. In standard optimization, we have finitely many or in same infinite, infinitely many equality and or inequality constraints. Here we have this minimum function for pairs of uh, functions. And uh, that makes the whole thing, we can see that in, in, in the picture. Ah, okay, as a P is our, our problem under consideration. And uh, the defining vector of functions is F, the objective functions and the constraints R and S. That means we will perturb this function and ask the question, what happens if we perturb sufficiently small, again, the function value, the first derivative, and all the second derivatives as well. Before I uh, say something about the difference or the difficulty of this problem class compared to standard optimization, let us look here at a small example. We are in the three-dimensional space, and then we see we have two minimum constraints, as we have two pairs, 
in the first pair, the functions are x1 and x2. And in the second pair, you can see it. Um, and then uh, on the right hand side, you see the uh, corresponding feasible set. And the interesting point here, which makes a difference to the standard case, is the origin. Here with red underlined, uh, because there we have a non differentiable, non smooth local uh, uh, description of the feasible set. So it means the whole machinery of differentiable optimization we cannot apply here without or straightforwardly. Yeah? There must be done something. We got here some kind of combinatorical uh, um, combinatorical feature into account here. And um, we will see that this is exactly the problem when we uh, consider these mathematical problems with complementarity constraints. But one of the ideas to solve this is, of course, as one tries always to do, to go back to standard optimization when we, on the, on the right-hand side of the constraints, substitute zero by an epsilon, for example, then uh, we got not this, this uh, nick here in the origin, then we got a differentiable curve. But for our investigation, we are not doing this because we are not considering, we are not substituting our problems by another uh, class of problems. But we want to investigate the question, how can we um, ensure that after sufficiently small perturbations, the local existence and uniqueness is maintained of a solution? And also that, of course, this uh, uniquely determined solution of the perturbed problem depends continuously on the uh, on the perturbation. The question is, of course, what is a solution in that context? And um, in other words, what is a stationary point uh, of a problem um, with the complementarity constraints? The difficulty is here uh, that there are several concepts of stationarity, A, B, C, M, S, as a, uh, several authors introduced several concepts of stationarity, which of course has then also um, uh, consequences for the design of numerical solution methods. Um, we showed 10 years ago, we means in that case with Bert Jongen from Aachen and Wladimir Schickmann this time from Aachen, that's the C stationary T concept is exactly the analogon to the stationarity concept in uh, standard nonlinear optimization in the following sense. Uh, for most theory, we know if we pass a level of the objective function, which contains a stationary point, then the topological structure of the feasible uh, level set is changing. Yeah? A new component will, is born or two com components come together when we pass a several point of index one and so on. Yeah, so if and only if, we have a stationary point, then we uh, change the uh, topological structure of the feasible level set. And this has, of course, uh, implications, conclusions for the design of uh, solution methods uh, via homotopy methods or via global optimization. So in that sense, the stationarity is the analogon to stationary in standard optimization. Of course, there are stronger stationarity concepts, for example, MOS stationarity, uh, because in C stationarity, for, for example, we have uh, trivial uh, descent directions still included, which is not in the stationarity case for nonlinear standard optimization. So this is a little bit the background um, why uh, we choose here as the uh, solution under consideration the C stationary points. Okay, uh, here are some keywords where this kind of model is uh, used, uh, which I will not go into detail here. Strong stability, uh, what I already said, this is related to local uniqueness, existence, and continuous dependence on the perturbation. And this is important for sensitivity analysis, parametric optimization, for the design of uh, solution methods, and so on. Okay. Now a little bit, uh, some technical things we have to consider here. As a remember that um, we are considering 
pairs of functions, Ri and Si, and at least one of them must be zero at the feasible point. So that means we can distinguish here between three different uh, situations. Uh, the first index set refers to the situation where the first function is zero, as an Ri is zero, the second where the second is zero, and the first not. And then the interesting point is, as you remember this picture with the origin, when both are zero. That is a third set, and this is the interesting set, because the first two, if you have such a situation, then uh, where only one of the constraints is zero, then this can be considered locally as, a, as an equality constraint. Yeah, there we can use the machinery of uh, standard optimization. The interesting point here, the new point, the new technique uh, uh, demand that comes into play when we are considering uh, the third index set, R, I, R, S. And we will also use here a constraint qualification, of course. And um, we say here, we look uh, in the first two, uh, D, R, I, D, S, J, as D is a gradient here, um, are those from uh, the pairs where only one uh, constraint is active. The interesting part again comes into play when we look at the pairs, the third line here, as the fourth line, uh, where we have pairs which, where both are active. And then we say for any convex combination, as a lambda m is varying here in the interval 0, 1, for any convex combination of these two together with the rest, we get linearly independence. This is uh, an analog to Marzahn Formowitz because uh, the dual formulation means we have no, there's not a um, corresponding um, co uh, co combination of the gradients of these active constraints. Okay, so as of here, I try to say that again with red. The first two are like in the standard case where, because there's only one active constraint. And then this is a new thing here where we look at any convex combination of both. Yeah, this is a little bit related to subdifferential, max subdifferential. Okay, so for all lambda between zero and one. Um, we, there are some uh, papers about stability of the feasible set, uh, which we gave here. Um, especially the second one, the first step in direction of uh, considering strong stability for this kind of problems was done in a paper with together with Schickman and Stephenson in 2010. There they did this under the linear independence constraint qualification. Yeah, so this is a very special case where everything is nice because uh, we are looking at manifolds locally. Um, what we, instead of LICQ now, if I go back, we are looking at this Mangazine form of its constraint qualification in our context. Of course, the question behind us then is this also a necessary condition? I come back to the answer of this question later because the Mangazine form of its constraint qualification for standard nonlinear optimization is a necessary condition for strong stability. We will see what happens here. Okay. So, one. Uh, two goals in that sense, as we, we introduce constraint qualification and we will provide necessary condition, and then we will characterize the strong stability of C stationary points in MPCC with uh, n plus one active constraints. The point is that this concept of strong stability, that we ignore this, <laughs> so we come to the second point now, notations and definitions. Uh, this is our Lagrange, multiple, Lagrange function, so this is not a surprise. And um, we say, we have to say now, what is a C-stationary point? Here's the definition of it. The feasible point X bar is called C-stationary, if of course a Lagrange function is zero. And we have uh, two vectors from RL, rho and sigma, uh, which uh, fulfill here uh, a complementarity condition, so that means either the multiplier is zero or the function is zero, that is like a standard optimization. But the difference is the third one, uh, namely that we allow that pairwise they have the same sign. So that means pairwise it can be negative, 
uh, both. So that means um, a C stationary point is where pairwise the Lagrange multiplier have the same sign. So obviously that is a much bigger set than uh, that we know from standard optimization where we always have no negativity for the inequality constraints multiplier. Um, let us uh, call sigma C the set of stationary points and uh, the corresponding Lagrange vectors O sigma uh, gold is L of P and X bar. Okay, so here again we have our index sets now. It is a repetition, what I also say, already said, but now we uh, will use it. And uh, what we are doing here is we put together the active... Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we put together the active constraints with respect to the functions ri. So it means we put together ir, that is in the first line, and the part from uh, irs, which is in the third line. They are together in ir bar, and they refer, or they are exactly the index set of the active constraints for r, and analogously for, for s. Um, we will take the number of active constraints and uh, as I already said, we will look here at the special case for n plus one active constraints. Now, the definition. Uh, we need for the uh, definition or for the recalling of the strong stability concept, the same norm for the function vector FRS. Uh, and that means we are looking at the difference between the, fu the function value and the first and second order derivatives of the original function minus the analogous value of the perturbed function. And that should be, if we go here to the last line, um, that should be less than a given epsilon. Yeah, this is a semi-norm because it is, it's not a norm because uh, that can be zero. No, this, yeah, this can be zero if we have outside of our neighborhood a, a difference between the functions and the norm can only be zero if the functions are equal. So that's why it's a semi-norm, but this is uh, not important for us. We have to work with this definition here. Okay. And now um, the concept of strong stability. Um, let me say something about the history a little bit. This concept was introduced for... Um, standard uh, nonlinear optimization by Kojima in the 80s. And um, he gave the definition can be taken for any kind of um, uh, class of optimization programs, as you can see this. Uh, I come back to this point. Let's see it's the definition first. As we call a point strongly stable, if for some delta bar, which is fixed, and each delta in this interval, we have a positive number epsilon such that for each sufficiently small perturbed problem P, we have that there is exactly one solution. As a solution means here C stationary point in this uh, neighborhood of X bar and also in the big neighborhood. This is very important. Huh? We fix the delta bar. Yeah? This refers, let we say, for each delta between zero and delta bar, there exists such an epsilon. This is continuity. Yeah, depending continuously on the perturbation, and that must be one. We have as an existence and uniqueness for each sufficiently small perturbed problem locally around this point, which we call strongly stable. And um, okay, now let me say something more about here. And um, of course, this is a topological definition. You cannot handle it if you have a point. You cannot check that. That is an abstract uh, definition of continuity. And the merit of Kojima's work, therefore, consists in um, presenting an equivalent algebraic characterization in terms of the matrices of the Hessian and so on. That can be at least better uh, checked than this topological definition. And that is, was also our goal. Now, the definition, as you can see here, that can be written in three lines to say, okay, this is a strongly stable point. But the question is, can we find an equivalent algebraic characterization which can be handled, really, uh, and can be checked uh, 
whether or not a given point is strongly stable. Okay, this is uh, our um, little bit our goal here to find an algebraic characterization. And now for our special class of problems with complementarity constraints. The first step in this direction will be uh, the presentation of necessary condition. And uh, we will look here at two different constraint qualifications. The first is called C21. And we say that this is fulfilled at uh, the point under consideration X bar if these vectors here are independent. So what is the difference? The red one is the difference to the Mangesein formulas condition because we say here that lambda is either zero or one. Yeah, so that means we have the gradients of Ri where only one, namely Ri, is uh, active and not Si. Here is also only Si, Sj active but not Rj. Here are both active, that was this index set here. And we say, either we take lambda m as zero, then we have the sm together with the first, the, from the first two lines, or we have the rm when lambda m is one. And then we say all of them have to be linearly independent. We will see that that is a necessary condition uh, for strong stability. And of course, MFC, the Mangazaran formulas condition, was when we have all lambdas and have linearly independence for any convex combination. Here we have only for zero and one, that means it is a much stronger condition and we have uh, this direction here. And we have, our statement is, the first necessary condition is if we have a strong stability, that is a strong condition, then this CQ1 must be fulfilled. Uh, the second necessary condition we discussed in our paper was uh, that if the Mangazaran formulas condition does not hold, then we got an estimate here, a lower and an upper bound for the number of active constraints, which we can see here. As well, E S is the number of strongly stable stationary points, and we say we have a strongly stable stationary point. But our Mangazaran from its condition does not hold. We will see if that exists. But of course, I can all, you already guess now that um, the answer is no. Yeah, as it can be that we have strongly stable point and where this Mangazaran from its condition is not fulfilled. Anyway, if we assume that, then we got an estimate here that the number of constraints, active constraints, must be greater than the dimension of the space. And it must be less. L was a number of pairs. Yeah, so we have two times L number of functions, L Ris and L Sjs. And uh, there must be this estimate. The yeah, number of active constants must be less than or equal to 2 L, which is clear. And uh, that is less than 2N. Uh, we come now to the special condition that we have exactly n plus one. Yeah, as I remember, we have a, we need at least n plus one, and we look at the situation where we have n plus one. We will use this case, not here in this lecture, but in, in the thesis, for the cases where we have a bigger number here. But this is a basis for all the other things uh, which are coming up. Okay, we, we defined CQ1. Now let us define CQ2. Uh, under this n plus one, and we say the following. If we, we have n plus one active constraints here, and if we take one of them out, then the rest should be linearly independent. So that means we have here uh, n plus one, so we have a combination of it, which gives zero. And um, if we take one out, then we have linear independence. That means none of these uh, up to multiple uniquely determined coefficients of these combinations um, can be zero. Yeah, so these are things which can be uh, obtained by perturbing the original function in order to get. Yeah, so again, we have here n plus one. That is our assumption here. If we take one out, then the rest should be linearly independent. Okay, so the first uh, statement here now under, in, under the assumption that we have n plus one active constraints is that 
if we have a strongly stable point and uh, the minus iron false condition does not hold, then CQ2 holds at X bar. This, as a, let me repeat this, this is the interesting question, one of the interesting questions. Um, is it possible that we have strong stability and MFC does not hold? If it is the case, the special case, then we already know that this must be fulfilled. And uh, here comes that again, where what I just said. No? So if it's CQ2, let me come back to that. As I remember, uh, as CQ2, we take one out and the rest is linear and independent. So we have it here again. Then, of course, we have a uh, combination of the zero of these gradients of all, uh, all constraints. Those which are non-zero, then the alpha m or beta m is zero. This is this standard formulation here. So we are only interested in those which are active. And for those, we have that alpha m and beta m must be unequal to zero. That is a direct consequence of CQ2. And uh, the next lemma is now that if we have n plus 1 and n of them are linearly independent, then, of course, these alpha and beta, I come back, Moment, this alpha and beta, which uh, characterizes this uniquely determined uh, combination here, yeah? uniquely determined up to a multiple, of course. And then we have that the number of Lagrange vectors is a fixed one plus any multiple of alpha and beta. Yeah? If you take alpha and beta, then this combination is zero. That means uh, the set of um, the set of Lagrange vectors is this one-dimensional uh, space here, affine, affine space. And um, we can then say it is C stationary if uh, both elements have the same sign. Yeah? As all T, where the product of these two is greater than or equal to zero. This is a way to characterize the set of uh, Lagrange vectors at the C stationary point. For the case n plus 1, it is, of course, clear that if we uh, look at higher dimension, then this becomes much more complicated. However, um, if we remember the result by Kojima, uh, for his characterization, and when he considered the case that the Mamazine form of its constraint codification holds, but not the linearly independence constraint codification, then he looked at the set of uh, Lagrange vectors. And we know that under MFCQ, this set is in a uh, compact polyhedron. And uh, for formulating a characterization of strong stability, he looked at the uh, extreme points, at the vertices of uh, this polyhedron. And that is enough. If you know what happens in the vertices, then you know the rest, yeah, because it's a convex set. Um, this is not the case here. So, as a LP of X bar, in that case of n plus 1, it is uh, an interval, obviously, because it's a one-dimensional affine space. But in the general case, it is not a convex set. It is a union of convex sets. But this is, uh, then, that would be uh, the topic of another lecture. Um, that means from now on, we assume that we have n plus 1 active constraints, and we assume that this second constraint qualification, CQ2, holds at the point under consideration. Okay, now mm, we introduce an important definition. I already said it implicitly a little bit. We say that in Lagrange vector is basic if one of them is zero, or some index m0 that was a set where both functions are active, as a biactive uh, pair of functions. And um, this is, that is good to have that in mind, perhaps. This is related to the extreme point of the Lagrange vector set in case of standard linear optimization, because then here we have a change of the, if it goes over zero, we have a change uh, of 
uh, the sign, and they must be greater than or equal to zero, as so the product must be greater than or equal to zero. And it is a similar situation as for Kojima. We are interested in the set of basic Lagrange vectors, um, and then from this set we can conclude to the rest of, uh, of, the, of the whole set of Lagrange vectors. Oops. So the theorem here is, um, again, that is still a necessary condition. If X bar is uh, strongly stable, we have at least two of these basic vectors. Yeah, remember, it's an interval you know, in the happy case. Uh, so that means these are the two endpoints of the interval. And um, we come back to this uh, example, which we have seen in the beginning. Uh, OK, I have here. I can hear some noises here. I hope you understand me. Um, and um, we can uh, straightforwardly check here that the Mangsan formals condition does not hold at zero. Remember our question is it possible that MFC does not hold at zero, but the point could be strongly stable? Um, we will come back to this answer in a moment. Let us um, now look at equivalent characterization. Uh, remember what I said, we have the topological characterization, which is a definition of continuity. And uh, now we go to the question if we can equivalently characterize strong stability using an algebraic formulation, as a using the information which we get directly from the functions. For example, the Lagrangian or the Hessian, and so on. Okay, for a vector W, here we define the set of uh, zero coefficients and the set of non zero coefficients in that way. And uh, for, uh, for a Lagrange vector, we define here corresponding tangent space. That is, is a normal definition, usual definition. And we say the following. Uh, we call it good. We found another characterization. We called it condition C in the thesis because good, finally, we didn't found it so good. Um, so we say a Lagrange vector is good. So, of course, we stay here now. And now, in this condition, which is following now, comes the second order information into account. It is clear that if we want to talk about what happens under perturbations up to second order, then this condition must take into account second order conditions as well. And it says here, as well, we have the um, Lagrangian at the point under consideration x bar, and at this Lagrange vector, O sigma, what we, are, what we are calling good here. The difference now to the standard optimization comes in, uh, by this multiplication here. We multiply it with the corresponding coefficient of the Lagrange vector, and that must be positive definite, restricted to the tangent space. Uh, so we have, the, we have a matrix restricted to the tangent space, so we take a basis matrix of it and multiply it from both sides, and then we say all these uh, eigenvalues of the restricted matrix must be non-zero. And uh, the same holds, of course, for the elements rho j. And we see it already. This is the Lagrange, the Hessian of the Lagrangian is the same here in both lines. And then we say rho sigma and uh, sigma i and rho j, and both must be positive definite. That gives us all, all, we will see that this condition, of course, is related to strong stability. And if this condition holds, that means if these um, products here both have the possibility that they are positive definite then these uh, Lagrange vectors have to have the same sign. That is the first observation which we can do immediately. Okay. Yeah, so here that is what I said. Take the Lagrange function, the Hessian of the Lagrange function, take the product with the corresponding coefficient of the Lagrange vector, and then we have, uh, we need positive definiteness. Um, now let us look at two cases. 
we have seen that we have um, at least two, and we can see uh, we have maximal two uh, basic Lagrange vectors. It means we, we, we can also show that there must be one, of course, because of the constraint qualification. So it means we have exactly two situations. We have one a singleton, which we consider now, and we have then the situation where we have two constraint qualifications. So if we have one, then we can remember what we want. We want to characterize it equivalently to the topological definition. This is done here in the theorem. We assume that we have not this situation. This situation means if it, if it would be uh, non, if it would be empty, then we have, uh, no, what? if it is non-empty, we have the situation here that is non-empty, which means we have um, a pair of active constraints where the corresponding Lagrange multipliers are zero. So we have a pair zero, zero of Lagrange multipliers. In that case, the strong stability of the point under consideration X bar is equivalent to the existence of an um, index M0 from the set of biactive constraints, and it holds that it is exactly one uh, elements of coefficients of this row and sigma, which is zero, you know, for one and zero. As if we have zero, zero, then there are no other zeros, okay? And of course, we have here that the alpha beta, remember alpha beta, where the coefficients of this uh, uniquely determined up to multiple um, combination of the uh, gradients. Uh, and then we see that this alpha and the beta have different signs. As again, we have strong stability. If under the case we have double zero, then strong stability can only appear if exactly these are the only the only zeros and the corresponding alpha and beta have different signs. And uh, you can show here that the Mangazan form of its condition holds. Uh, we are still in that case. So in, in the previous theorem, we looked here if that is unequal to zero, and so if we have a double zero in the set of Lagrange multipliers. Now we look at the case that we have no double zero. That means if we have a pair of two active constraints, then only one could be zero or none. Okay. And then the condition of goodness is equivalent to this um, strong stability, the goodness of this basic Lagrange vector here. We have only one, and it must be good. Then we get uh, strong stability. No, this is an equivalent characterization here, if and only if. And also here we can show that the Mangazan formulas condition holds. No, remember that was our question always in, in the back. Um, is it possible that we have strong stability, but Mangazan formulas condition does not hold? So up to now it holds always. Now we come to the second case. As we had two cases, no? the set of Lagrange multiplier, a uh, basic Lagrange multipliers, a uh, zero cannot be zero, there must be one, and it is maximal two. So we had looked at the case of a singleton. Now we look at this case where we have uh, two. And then uh, this is a, uh, here comes, one can already uh, see that here is some combinatorial. Um, considerations come into play, Com combinatorial considerations which do not appear in case of standard optimization. And uh, this theorem states uh, equivalent characterization of strong stability, as we see it here, the point X bar is strongly stable if and only if, and now comes the condition for these two basic Lagrange multipliers, O1 sigma 1 and O2 sigma 1, O2 sigma 2, and uh, we got here these conditions, which I will not go through now, but you see these are conditions um, concerning the behavior of the alpha and beta. Alpha and beta were the, the combination of the zero, which are uniquely determined up to a multiple. So what we are doing here is 
formulate conditions about their signs. Yeah, also here it is always negative, that means we have always different signs here for these pairs which we are considering here. And this may, it may happen here that uh, the Manga Zion form of its condition is not fulfilled. So that means um, one can say this is only theoretical, but if we go back here to our example, of course, the example is chosen in that way, then uh, we have that MFC does not hold, we already know that, but the question is the last one here. Yeah, is the origin, yeah, that is a critical point in the sense of um, difference to properties when open standard optimization, and this is a strongly stable point, there, exactly the conditions of the previous theory are fulfilled at this point. Yeah, conclusions. Strong stability implies CQ1, or CQ1 is here in, uh, a necessary condition. We have uh, presented an upper and a lower bound for the uh, number of active constraints at a point uh, which is strongly stable in case that uh, MFC does not hold. Now we know that this is not only a pathological case, we know that can happen. Um, what we did was considering the special case of N plus 1 active constraints, and uh, we defined a second constraint quantification called CQ2 here. Strong stability does not imply MFC. Yeah, that was our uh, background and the whole picture. And uh, yeah, that's all what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi. Are you still there? Muchas gracias a Alan por por el seminario. Ahora comienza el turno de preguntas. Recordar a los asistentes que deben solicitar la palabra a través del chat y se les seguirá concediendo. Si alguno quiere activar también la cámara para que se le vea. Uh, thanks, Jan, for your interesting talk. My question has to see with the possibility of developing algorithms to check the new CQs. Uh, okay, so this is a good question. Uh, I mean, you, you can check uh, linear independence, of course, but I think mm -hmm. you cannot check um, positive definiteness. That must be taken from the, let's say, from the functions you put in. As if you say you have a convex function, then you have some kind of positive semi-definiteness, semi for example. Um, also in that sense, there is no general algorithm to check this, the, the goodness, no? also the second order condition. Yeah. Goodness is always very difficult to be very high. <laughs> okay. Yes, of course, of course. But, but I mean, the topological definition is, of course, it can not handle at all. Epsilon delta definition you cannot check. Okay. okay. I see, uh, Javier, I didn't greet you in the beginning. Uh, but, uh, Arra, you have a question, no? You say, yes, uh, I, I, I would like to ask a question. Yes, uh, this is because uh, many times it has happened to us that when we perturb functions with just constants, what we call rigid perturbations, mm -hmm. we uh, somehow attain all the possibilities, all the, uh, the, the uh, bad behavior, for example. So my question is, since you are perturbing the function, the first derivative and the second derivative, is it, um, uh, what about uh, rigid perturbations in the sense of uh, you add to the function a uh, second degree polynomial, let's say a plus bx plus c over 2x squared. Is it enough to, uh, for contraexamples or um, to confine to these specific perturbations of adding second degree polynomials yeah. to functions? Um, yes, so what you can do is uh, you can, let's say, add a, a small square. If you want to, if you say so you have one zero eigenvalue and um, you want to f 
you want to focus only on one of the constraints. It means you can take all the others out and you can add, uh, for example, small uh, squares, so the epsilon times x1 square. That uh -huh. could be very small, but then you, that means it is then x is zero origin that you can always do, of course, or x minus x bar. Uh, but the second derivative is, is uh, perturbed then in the sense by this epsilon, two times epsilon. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, that you need when you want to have an, an, a property for the for the matrix, for the eigenvalues of the matrix. Uh, so if something is not definite or one eigenvalue is zero, then you must um, use second order uh, out of the uh -huh. units. Also epsilon times x squared, let's say. Very simple. Uh -huh. So, uh, thank you. And, and just out of curiosity, what does a uh, the C stand for is complementary and C is stationary. No, I think it's Clark. <laughs> ah, Clark, okay. I think he provided M, M stationary is Mordokovic, Boris, and uh, the other is Frank Clark. Okay. I'm not sure about that, but uh, that is what. Uh, okay, okay. What, what one says. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you and congratulations for the talk. Yeah, thank you very much again for the nice invitation. It's my first virtual conference, scientific one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I hope we can see us in the future in a more physical way then. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Is there any other question? or? Well, if there's not any question, thank you, Jan. We hope to see you soon in Spain with our weather with our better weather than yours <laughs> and enjoying the time here we have some okay thank you very much bye everyone yeah, bye. Goodbye.